is a question we're asking is uh, what happens in the standard model and the rigid wedge model when the rotating cost R goes to zero. All right, so how are we going to analyze that? Um, well, it's, uh, it's pretty simple, really. So we want to study the equilibrium when we want to uh, <coughs> describe the equilibrium when R goes to zero. Um, but what's, what's nice or what's easy here is that in the matching model, the standard version, and it's in rigid weight version, um, it's very easy to see like what happens to the equilibrium. First, you can use the demand curve expression to study what happens to tightness, because you remember in these models, uh, if you think about them in the labor market diagram, um, tightness is determined by the demand uh, curve, which is horizontal, and then using that tightness, you can use the supply curve to figure out what is employment. Right, so you remember in this, in this, um, in this model, you, you have, if you were to plot the equilibrium, you know, with tightness and employment, <coughs> so you know the demand is horizontal, the demand curve, uh, and so the demand curve gives the tightness in itself, so if you want to see what happens to tightness, you can just study what happens to demand, and then you have a supply curve that's upward sloping, so then using the tightness and using your supply curve, you can figure out what happens to employment. Okay, and then from that, of course, you can infer unemployment, which is just the size of the labor force minus employment. Okay, so you can really uh, study this model in a two-step uh, two process. Um, first, you can look at the demand, and from that, you can learn what happens to uh, tightness, then you can look at the supply and that will tell you what happens to employment and unemployment. Okay, so it's, it's very simple. So here I want to know uh, what happens when the working cost goes to zero, so I can first study the demand, then study the supply, right? Um, okay, <clears throat> so let's look at the labor demand relations. Labor demand curves. So in both models, um, the demand is um, given by the fact that when firms uh, optimize profit, you remember that productivity has to be equal to, um, which is the marginal benefit from having a worker, has to be equal to the marginal cost from having a worker. And here the marginal cost is not only the wage you have to pay to producers, W, but also the fact that for each producer, you need to have tall recruiters in your firm. So, the labor demand curve they always say that productivity has to be equal to one plus tau of theta times the wage and um, times the wage and, and then the wage takes different expression if you have the rigid wage model or if you have uh, or if you have the standard model okay so uh, let's look first at what happens uh, with the standard model. So in that case, the wage uh, is given by uh, wage bargaining. In particular, we're going to use a surplus sharing solution. And as a result, uh, the labor demand equation becomes A is equal to 1 plus tau theta 
and then the weight that comes from surplus sharing is going to be 1 minus theta z plus beta a 1 plus r theta. Okay? Um, and in fact, here, because we're going to make and to study an experiment where r goes to zero, it's good to spell out what is tau of theta, because indeed tau of theta depends, the rupture producer ratio depends on uh, the rupturing cost. So a productivity is going to be equal to 1 plus uh, tau of theta. And in fact, 1 plus tau of theta can directly simplify it. So 1 plus tau of theta, actually, we know that it's going to be equal to Q of theta divided by um, Q of theta minus R times S. So that's 1 plus tau of theta if you uh, go back and figure out what is and look at the expression for tau of theta. Then we have this expression for the wedge that we have here, 1 minus beta z plus beta a 1 plus f theta. Okay, so this is our labor demand curve and you know it holds always in equilibrium and so now uh, what we want to study is what happens when r goes to zero. What's going to happen to, uh, so you know, this, of course this, uh, this labor demand relation it defines implicitly tightness in equilibrium and here, what, so if you solve this equation that we have in front of our eyes, you're going to find a tightness. And that tightness is a tightness that, uh, you know, is a tightness given by the demand curve. So if you solve that equation, you're going to find this tightness here. Okay? Uh, so you get a tightness if you solve that. But again, the tightness here is defined implicitly. And using the implicit function theorem, you can see that because the equation depends on the routing cost, which shows up here and here, implicitly the tightness that we get here is a, which we can put superscript uh, D because it comes from the demand relation. Our, our tightness depends on the routing cost. And what we are looking for is the limit when the routing cost goes to zero of the tightness of R. That's, that's what we're looking for. Okay? Because this is going to tell us what, so what the tightness coming out of the demand relation uh, is when R goes to zero, and, but that tightness is also the equilibrium tightness. So it's going to tell us what the equilibrium tightness is, and then using the supply curve, we can figure out what is employment. Okay? Uh, but let's look a little bit uh, at this equation. So we want the um, <coughs> left hand we want the right hand side to always be equal to A. So now, and now what we're going to do is we're going to take this R here. And that's going to go to zero. And we're going to also take this R here. And that's going to go uh, to zero. Okay. All right. So, uh, what, what happens then to our equation? So we can look at the, at the term here, the first term in the, in the bracket, Q of theta divided by Q of theta minus R times S. If R goes to zero for any theta, so Q of theta divided by Q of theta minus R times S, that's going to go to Q of theta divided by Q of theta, and that's just equal to one. Okay, so the first terms in the bracket, when R goes to zero, is going, going to converge to one for, for any theta. Okay, so that's going to, uh, that's going to simplify greatly our analysis. Okay, uh, so now what we know is that, uh, the labor demand when R goes to zero, the, the equation is going to become A, because the first term in bracket goes to one, it's just going to be A, it has to be equal to one minus beta, Z plus beta A one plus R theta. Okay. 
Okay, so that's just because we know that the one plus tau, uh, tau tails is going to converge to one. So that's what we have. But now here we have r, and r that's going to go to zero. So how can you make sure <coughs> uh, that um, Right. How are you going to make sure that this equation continues to hold when, uh, when r goes to zero? So we can, it's useful actually to just slightly rewrite this equation. So we have this, we can rewrite it as a is 1 minus beta z plus beta a plus beta a r theta. Okay, I've just expanded the second term. So I can write this as 1 minus beta a is equal to 1 minus beta z plus beta a r theta and I can therefore rewrite this as 1 minus beta a minus z is equal to beta a r theta okay so this is again another expression of our demand relation now 1 minus beta that's third bargaining power that's something that's strictly positive a minus z that's the difference between labor productivity and the value of being unemployed. That's also strictly positive, you know, if, because if um, workers were more productive when they're unemployed than when they're employed, nobody would work. Everybody would work from home. Say if people were super productive at home, like on production was really developed. So, so it means that the <coughs> left hand side of the equation is strictly positive, always. Okay. Now, if R here goes to zero, that's going to bring the right hand side to zero. Beta a r theta is going to go to zero. But it has to be equal to, it has to remain equal to something that's strictly positive on the left hand side. So the only way that this equation remains valid when r goes to zero is if theta goes to infinity. Such so that r theta will have one term going to infinity, one term going to zero, and, and uh, therefore it could take a finite value. Okay, so the only way the equation, because for any, if theta goes to any finite value, when r goes to zero, the right hand side will go to zero and it cannot be equal to the left hand side, which is positive. So the only thing that can happen is that theta goes to infinity. So what we learn from that is that the limit of our demand curve theta when r goes to zero is going to be infinity. Okay, and so what we learn is that what that implies, because the demand curve determines the equilibrium tightness, is that the limit of our tightness in equilibrium when r goes to zero is going to be infinity. So tightness becomes infinite in the standard model when uh, the repeating cost goes to zero. So now, if there are no repeating costs, firms they are willing to hire uh, basically everybody. So tightness will go to infinity. And the reason is that uh, with bargaining, the wage is always strictly below productivity. So firms, when they have workers, they make some money equal to their productivity. They pay them a little bit less. So if we don't think about recruiting costs, firms, they make some profit from having workers. And the reason why, in general, they don't hire everybody is that they also have to pay recruiting costs that are going to absorb these profits. But now if the recruiting costs are zero, then firms will be happy to hire everybody in the labor force. So in the standard model, the only thing that prevents firms from absorbing everybody is that indeed there are some recruiting costs. And then as unemployment goes, uh, becomes lower and lower, tightness goes up higher and higher, it becomes more and more difficult to recruit workers and these recruiting costs become really severe for firms. It prevents them from hiring everybody. If you eliminate recruiting costs, firms are happy to absorb all the workers in the labor market. Okay, so tightness goes to infinity. What happens to uh, employment? So what is the li sorry? What is the limit of employment when R goes to zero? Well, employment, we as we saw, is always read off of the labor supply. So it's the limit of the labor supply of theta when theta goes to infinity. And the labor supply equation doesn't involve the working cost. And of course, the limit of the labor supply when the tightness goes to infinity is that's just equal to H. We know that the labor supply is an asymptotes to H when tightness is infinite. Okay? So it means that everybody in the labor force has a job once tightness is infinite.
Okay, and then what the what the what's happening to the unemployment level? Well, that's very easy. The limit, the limit of the number of unemployed when R goes to zero is the limit when R goes to zero of H, the number of people in the labor force minus L, the number of people who have a job, but L minus H, that's going to go to zero because L goes to H, and that's just equal to zero. So unemployment disappears. So we have no unemployment, that's the key thing. So unemployment vanishes when recruiting cost when the recruiting cost vanish. So it means that the only reason why there is unemployment is that there are recruiting costs. Um, so it's because there is these matching frictions that, uh, that there is some unemployment. So from this we learn that all unemployment is frictional. Because if the frictions we are not there, or no problem wouldn't be there. And so that's in our standard model. Great. So, you know, so the policies that make sense in that model when you have too much unemployment would be, you know, to try to reduce the opting cost, for instance, by changing labor market institutions or uh, implementing um, placement agencies. Um, so as we were discussing, these were policies that have been very popular in Europe, for instance, where the matching model is, um, in its standard form is very well regarded.